tras pasar un mes excavando en busca de huesos, dientes y otros fascinantes vestigios de los dinosaurios en el noroeste estadounidense, finalmente llegó el momento de que estos, cuidadosamente preparados para su transporte, emprendan el camino hacia su nuevo hogar. Pero el proceso de preparación para dejarlos en las condiciones propicias para ser estudiados o expuestos en museos, tan solo está comenzando. ¿Qué pasará con estas preciosas piezas del pasado una vez que abandonen el lugar que las resguardó por tanto tiempo? Varios kilómetros recorridos y finalmente la alegría de llegar a destino. La Universidad Adventista del Sudoeste en Texas, Estados Unidos. El grupo de estudiantes y profesores ahora se dispone a descargar con cuidado su preciosa carga. Deben cerciorarse de que toda la preparación previa haya cumplido su importante misión. La de proteger estas frágiles reliquias de las peripecias del camino. Once the bones have been discovered and they have been uncovered and they have been GPSed and photographed, then we very carefully carefully remove them from the ground. And we if they're small bones, we can preserve them, protect them in uh, aluminum foil or or some kind of protective material. Then They are boxed up with bubble wrap and sent back to our laboratory in Keene. If they're bigger bones, kind of intermediate sized bones, we will wrap them in foil and then we will foam them to a board with insulating foam so that they're stuck on the board and they're protected by the foam. And then we wrap those in bubble wrap and, and ship them back also. And the bigger bones, the ones that are too big to do either one of those procedures, we actually have to make a cast, a plaster cast of the bone. So we wrap the bone just like if you had a broken leg or arm. We wrap the bone with plaster and, and burlap or some other cloth. And then we bring those back into uh, the camp and we take them home, wrap them in bubble wrap also, and take them back to Keene. Once they get in Keene, In, in Texas, once we've taken them back to Texas, we uh, then process the bones in our, in our new laboratory and museum. And we have special equipment there that allows us to work on the bones and removes the dust and debris so that uh, we can clean them very carefully and bring them uh, into the museum. Tenemos como 2,000 huesos que tenemos cada año, creo. Y entonces, por estar hecho ahí eso como 10 años, uh, tenemos como 20,000 huesos, creo, en el museo. Y como cada, cada año, creo que hago como 1,000 huesos, tal vez. Mi trabajo es tomarle fotos a los huesos aquí que llegan al museo y después que le tomo fotos le pongo como en la, en la computadora para que sean así de, de, para moverse, no sé cómo se dice. Y después de eso los muevo al museo en su lugar y empiezo todo de nuevo, entonces. Cuando los correcto en la, en la computadora tengo que ir a Photoshop y con eso ya arreglo todas las fotos para que salen bonitas. Pues cuando tiene esa foto voy a tener que hacer un, una de estas acciones. Y después la metemos a otro programa que se llama Remake y con eso se hace un objeto de como que se puede mover y con eso podemos ponerlo a manipularlos y hacer como 
imágenes de eso o también ahora podemos construir huesos de nuevo como de apegamento o algo así con nuestra máquina de 3D. Aunque por momentos pareciera que la tecnología se ha tomado su tiempo para ingresar en el mundo de la paleontología, el poder de lo que ambas pueden lograr juntas es sin duda incuestionable. Sus aplicaciones son numerosas, desde reconstruir escenarios, duplicar piezas, geolocalizarlas, hasta hacer posible que toda esta información esté disponible para aquel que quiera observar por sí mismo los restos de dinosaurios excavados en esta, que tras 20 años de recolectar datos, es la mayor excavación virtual del mundo. Todos pueden accesar todas las fotos de, de que tomamos aquí en el internet, además a fossil.suavo.edu y de eso puedes encontrar todo por, por la persona de Browse Collection. Pues va a seguir como fossil.suavo.edu Vas al de Browse Collection y pones su número, como este va a ser 13985 y va a aparecer el hueso. Y desde ahí, puedes tener toda la información, como en dónde está en el museo, cuándo lo encontramos, cuándo lo arreglamos, um, dónde se encontró, qué tipo de dinosaurio es, qué tipo de hueso, y en, en qué condición está, quién lo encontró, quién lo preparó. Y luego vas aquí y tienes las fotos. Entonces, con esta foto ya ves cómo se, ve, se encontró allá en el piso, ¿verdad? Puedes ver dónde la encontramos en una mapa comparado con todos los otros huesos de ahí. Y puedes ver los, las fotos entre 300 y, y 60 grados así. Y se mueven. Y también como si quieres ver los que tienen fotos de 3D o algo así, que son imágenes de objetos, o pues si quieres buscar como diente o algo, le pones tooth y te enseña todos los que tenemos aquí. Entonces, si quieres como parte de la pierna, un fémur. Aquí tienes todos los huesos. Each year we go to Wyoming to dig for about a month. And during that month, we excavate between 1,000 and 2,000 bones. Those bones uh, are enough to keep us busy the whole year, trying to get them cleaned and prepared and numbered and then curated into the collection and photographed. So we don't want to go for a longer period of time. We, we only want to spend a month there each year because if we stayed longer, we'd have more bones. And one of my pledges when I began this project was that I wouldn't dig bones out of the ground and then let them sit around somewhere that they had to be clean, cleaned and prepared and curated so that they wouldn't just uh, waste away. Because my whole goal in starting this project was to preserve as much information as I could about these amazing animals. So we've, we've been very firm about that and just spend a single month out there Uh, in order not to get behind in processing the bones. Tratar la información recolectada de manera detallada y cuidadosa es indispensable para el desarrollo de una ciencia seria y responsable. Solo al procesar los huesos con precisión, catalogándolos correctamente y velando por su adecuada preservación, será posible que el material siga estando disponible para las investigaciones sobre dinosaurios en futuras generaciones. Generaciones que primeramente deberán ser introducidas a las ciencias y a la paleontología a través de la educación. Museos y proyectos como este que tienen el objetivo de reconstruir pequeños fragmentos de esta historia para despertar en el público la curiosidad por saber más de estos seres que muchas veces parecieran querer permanecer ocultos en el pasado. This is for the dinosaur called a Thesaurus. 
It's a small vegetarian that is on, from the hips, floor to the hips, is only about three foot tall. Tip of his nose, the tip of his tail, 10 to 12 foot long. So it's one of the smaller dinosaurs that, uh, that we have. And it's a very important dinosaur for us in that it is probably the most, in fact, it is the most complete dinosaur uh, that we actually have. That all the pieces that you see here all belong, all the original vertebrae all belong to this one dinosaur. We have a lot of vertebrae, but and we know what type of dinosaur, but we don't know which one. This one, they all belong to the same dinosaur. So it's very, very important. A lot of the dinosaurs that they uh, mount, they find one vertebrae maybe, and so they just make a whole bunch of those. Or they take a vertebrae from a different dinosaur, and most of us wouldn't know the difference. And so here we know for fact, because they were in the ground, just as you see them here, that it came from that one specific dinosaur. So it's a very, very important one for us. The work that I am doing is easy to learn. Uh, it takes a little bit of experience, uh, but the process, you know, uh, is not that difficult. Uh, your difficult part is trying to identify uh, which animal the, the, the vertebrae or whatever piece of bone you have, which animal it came from, and if you don't have the complete uh, bone, what does the rest of it look like? And so that requires a lot of study to compare pictures, and, uh, and we, we spend a lot of time in books and internet and uh, talking with other paleontologists to get advice about what we're doing and what something should look like. So the book that I'm going by here is actually uh, the field guide that Keith Snyder had written. And so we made a copy of it because he uh, is the one who has dug this thesaurus out of the ground. And so he's got detailed pictures. Oh, this is the one I wanted. And here is the sacrum as he pulled it out and then the vertebrae that went behind it. And they were all together in the ground. And that would be this picture here, which you probably can't see in detail, but there's the, uh, the, uh, the sacrum and the vertebrae behind it in the ground. So we know these all go to the same animal. And then other pieces of him too. Now, what we have done, because we do not have, or we do not think right now, that we have all the vertebrae. And so what we have done is taken a vertebrae and uh, we, we do it in 3D. So we uh, take 32 pictures in one revolution and then they can uh, then put that uh, onto the computer, into the 3D printer, and it comes out with uh, almost a perfect image of what this was. If we don't have all of these neck vertebrae, we can make another one either smaller or larger using the computer. And uh, once it's painted up and put into where it belongs up in the front of the head, then you wouldn't know that there's a difference in them. Hopefully, that's my goal, is to have them look exactly as much as we can. And that's a 3D. Now that is one of the ways we make copies of it. That's what we've started doing now. Another way is, and this is a different, uh, different uh, two other way. So this is a copy. Now this is also a copy of a bone. This is made, we made, took the original bone and we made a mold of it. Uh, we'll sh see how that's done here in a little while. We made an actual mold and then we poured that mold with some special uh, polymers that uh, comes up with, and it's a white color as well, but this one I have uh, painted uh, uh, to make it look very much like the original bone.
All right, we are going to now uh, attempt to paint. This is a copy of a T-Rex tooth that we have, the original of, and I made a cast of it. Uh, and I'm trying to, it originally was white, and I've put an undercoating of paint on it, and now I'm gonna try and get it a little closer to what the actual color would be by using, and I'm using, uh, I'm using acrylic paint today. And uh, so we're gonna do that. So normally, you know, this tooth would be about like the same color, just as this one was the same color. And I've already worked on it a little bit and I will work on it some more. And it takes, I have found that uh, if I do it in layers, I get a better copy on the, on the material than if I just kind of slap a lot of them on. We're, we're experimenting, trying to decide now these are two pieces, real pieces of dinosaur bone. So sometimes I will try to get them to look this color, sometimes the other color, and sometimes maybe almost a complete black. Because some of our bones just totally vary in colorations of it. So try to get it look like what it's somewhat supposed to be is not always easy. This particular claw, this is a 3D printed claw, and you can see the lines of where it was printed but it looks kind of neat here. Uh, this we have put on uh, uh, stain, brushed on stain, wiped, took a rag and wiped it on. So we're experimenting with that to see how that works. We're doing a lot of experimenting. Now with this particular one, now this is from our Thesaurus. I uh, built up some of the pieces here, but it's very easy to tell they don't match. It looks ugly. So if we take some of the same paint, now first what I want to do is use some of this fixer on it, and I'll try not to get it on your, you or your cameras, uh, that we can uh, let that dry for a few minutes, and then we'll be able to paint over that and be able to blend it in. Now notice we've got the different colors in here. So it's not a solid. In a lot of uh, museums, when you go to see the dinosaurs, they're all solid because it's so much easier to paint just a solid color and then they go back and make some details. So they may not have the budget or the time or the desire, whereas I do. So then when that dries, and it doesn't take too long for it to dry, then I can take the paint and start adding it to and it will adhere better to uh, the uh, material, the Bondo material, the Paleo Bond. And uh, then by putting several coats of different colors on it, mixing a little bit of black with it, a little bit of beige with it, uh, we can get a closer coloration to what the actual bone looked like but it's a process of several, several uh, uh, coats of different colors of paint to make it real thin coats. And that will give us a good uh, rendition of it when we get to the actual darker browns. So in order to build these things, you find another one and then build it to look like that one. Now, not all the bones look exactly the same, even the vertebrae, not all of them look exactly the same. So you gotta compare the different types of vertebrae with the different vertebrae and make it to look like that. Some of them have a little curve down. Now, if I put it on this one that had the curve down, it would be wrong and it would be easy to detect. So it just takes a little time of research to study, to think about it. Uh, we're not going to use our own thoughts and make up something that did not belong there to begin with. We want to have it as close as we can uh, to the real. Why spend the time? You know, I've wondered that question myself. But, you know, like this one, the real bone, we can't send to maybe a school library or uh, to a group of people that want to talk about dinosaurs. And here you actually have something that they can show that will look the same, but it's not the real bone. So if it gets broken, 
okay, we'll make another copy of it. If the real one gets broken, then we have to uh, we have a lot more trouble with that. So we want to uh, we want to be able to have a lot of these available because we have schools that come through here all the time. Now, wouldn't that be nice to have one that the teacher could take back with her to her school and say, hey, this is what they really look like? El poder de los dinosaurios para atraer la atención de pequeñas y grandes mentes curiosas hacia la ciencia y el conocimiento es algo que no debe ser subestimado. Pero aún más fascinante es reconocer que estos descubrimientos también podrían impactar la forma en la que hoy interpretamos los orígenes. While we are interested in the science and in preserving the bones, we also are interested in the impact this will have on people's lives. This is probably the only scientific enterprise in the United States where people can come here and work on dinosaurs and do scientific research without uh, having to be uh, deeply involved in the philosophy of, of naturalism and, and evolution and long ages because we promote a view of this whole project that allows the opportunity to explore new ideas. And these new ideas are in the area of creation in, in uh, not millions of years, but something that's happened relatively recently. We find a lot of supportive data for this both in the disposition of the bones themselves, how they are in the ground, and also in the work that we do afterwards, looking for biomolecules and other markers that shouldn't be in these bones if they're millions of years old. So we are pursuing uh, the goal of trying to learn what the bones can tell us. This is basic science research. So you're trying, we're trying to find out something about how these animals died and what happened to them after they died. So you involve students in that, and they learn, they gain something from that type of research of actually getting in and solving problems and pulling out information that hadn't been known before. It can be very exciting for many students. There are all kinds of interesting questions um, that could be answered by the next generation that comes along, if they do it in a scientifically accurate, biblically consistent way. Descubrir, investigar, pensar, ejercer la característica que nos distingue como humanos, la de razonar, acercarnos a las evidencias con atención, pero sobre todo con la libertad de leer sus historias fielmente sin temor a los resultados. Libertad que radica también en la oportunidad de acceder a todo conocimiento que pueda informar nuestras perspectivas y, en definitiva, contribuir a la forma en la que nos acercamos a la ciencia y la interpretamos. I think it's really important that a, a place is provided for Christian scientists because What's happening in the United States and the world and the government of the United States is in all the colleges, what's taught is evolution. And if dinosaur fossils are found and they're found on public land like BLM land and federal land, well, they're not going to let a Christian scientist have a permit to come in to excavate. They're just not going to do it. And so I th it's really important that places are provided. And since this is private land, that's why the provision is here. God has left us here to, with the purpose of trying to accomplish this. And that's why we think it's important so that the world can get a different view and a different perspective other than what's being taught in the universities and the colleges about evolution. Through the years, it has become more and more evident to me that um, there was a reason that God put my grandfather here and homesteaded here and my dad here who had the conviction, you know, that 
that God put these bones here because now the reason is becoming evident because it's um, a big part of explaining uh, creationism with a scientific base and and it is truly true science and it's uh, it's it's sterling in character as well as the people operating it. God gave us through a series of relationships these scientists who are six-day creationists who use our bones to get people to questioning all of the things they've been taught and we don't say okay these bones were put here during the flood we just give them the evidence that they're finding that they're digging out of the hills with the bones and let them draw their own conclusions and um, the scientists do teach the evolutionary um, scale or whatever it's called here and as a theory which it is and they also teach creation as a theory which it is you can't prove God he's just there but you can come alongside of whatever God is doing and facilitate it as best you can one of the key reasons to have a place like Hanson Ranch is that we want all of our work to be scientifically accurate, but we want it all to be biblically consistent. We believe that there is truth, contrary to um, the millennial generation. There, there is a real truth, and we, we can know that truth. There's, there's revealed truth, and there's observational truth. Um, and since there is a, a real truth, if we had all of the knowledge, we should be able to mesh those together. And, and we should be able to have scientifically accurate and biblically consistent um, interpretations to what we're working on. And so that was the underlying methodology that um, we've used out there at the uh, Hanson Ranch.